Separate us from the love of Christ. No one shall separate us from the love of Christ. No one shall separate us from the love of Christ. No one shall separate us from the love of Christ. Shall tribulations or persecutions No, not one of these or more Not distressed, nor famine Peril, nakedness, or sword For we are more than conquerors We are more than conquerors We are more than conquerors And the truth of our Lord The Lord has done for you, but He's given me the strength, He's given me the power to be a conqueror. Oh, if you desire, He'll give it to you. Oh, He'll give it to you. He'll give it to you. Things will come will keep me down, down to the ground. Nor shall the height, Lord, nor shall the depth. Not any creature, not anyone God has made from his love will keep me kept. We, we are we are more than the words. We are more than the words. As it's true. Shine your light 
shining light on the world that's lost its Bring way. back the sun. Bring back the sun that scatters the night. Push back the clouds. Push back the clouds overhead. The dark is the day. Of the light of the world. Shine a light. Shine a light on the world that's lost its way. Bring back the sun. Bring back the sun that scatters the night. Push back the clouds. Push back the clouds overhead. The dark is the day. Of the light of the world. So many people are lost and cannot find the way. My salvation, bring back the light of day. Shine your light, shine your light on the world. Good morning. My name is Ed Henderson. I'm one of the elders here at the Forest Hill Church of Christ. And we want to welcome you to our worship service this morning. Thank you for inviting us into your homes. The Bible says in Psalms 118, verse 24, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Will you please pray with me at this time? Father God, we come before you at this time, being forever grateful and thankful for the things that you've done on our behalf. God, you've blessed us in many wonderful ways, and we thank you for that. We thank you for your son that you allowed to come down and offer himself so that we might have a good relationship with you. God, we ask you to bless this service this morning. May it be inspiring, may it be uplifting, and may it make our hearts to rejoice. God bless your manservant that will come before us shortly and deliver your word. May he do it in a way, Father, that is well-pleasing and acceptable in your sight. In the name of, name of your Son, Jesus, and our Savior, amen. Oh, when the Savior calls, I will answer. When he calls for me, I will hear. And when the Savior calls, I will answer. Because I'll be somewhere listening for my name. Oh, I'll be somewhere listening. I'll be somewhere Listening, I'll be somewhere, listening for my name. I'll be somewhere, listening, I'll be somewhere, listening, I'll be somewhere, listening for my name. And if my heart is right when he calls me, if my heart is right, I will hear, and if my heart is right, when he calls me, oh, I'll be somewhere listening for my name. Oh, I'll be somewhere listening, I'll be somewhere listening, I'll be somewhere listening for my name. My name, I'll be somewhere listening, I'll be somewhere listening, I'll be somewhere listening for my name. And if my robe is white when he calls me, if my robe is white, I will hear it. If my robe is white, when he calls me, oh, I'll be somewhere listening for my name. Oh, oh, I'll be somewhere listening, I'll be somewhere 
listening I'll be somewhere a listening for my name I'll be somewhere listening I'll be somewhere listening I'll be somewhere listening for my name When we reach that city of the new Jerusalem, we're gonna sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah, by and by. And how the ransom singers will together lift that hymn. We're gonna sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah, by and by. Don't you know that, oh, what joy when we Get home, we're gonna rest, rest beneath that cloudless dome. You know him, that land where the same never die. And we will sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah, by and by. And in that mighty chorus, voices will so sweetly blend, and we will sing holly. Come on and sing hallelujah, by and by. And gone will be our sadness, pleasures there will never. And we will sing holly. Come on and sing hallelujah, by and by. By. Don't you know that, oh, oh, a joy when we get home. We're going to rest, rest beneath that cloud. Let's go home. You know him of that land where the same never die. And we will sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah by and by and victory when love will be our everlasting theme come on now sing holly come on and sing hallelujah by and by and praising our redeemer there beside the crystal stream Oh, now sing holly. Come on and sing hallelujah by him. Don't you know? Sing oh, oh, a joy when we get home. We're gonna rest, rest beneath that cloud. Let's go home. Oh, in that land where the safe never die and we will sing hallelujah sing hallelujah by sing oh don't you know that oh oh what joy oh when we get home we're gonna rest rest beneath that cloud let's go home oh in that land where the saints Never die, and we will sing holly. Come on and sing hallelujah, bye and bye. We thank the God of heaven, which doeth all things well, for once again sparing our lives and blessing us with another privilege to be able to assemble ourselves together for the purpose of worshiping him in spirit and in truth. And for that, we ought to be eternally grateful and we are thankful. We're mindful of those who have lost loved ones recently. Uh, Sister Jacqueline Williams, who serves this church as secretary, lost her father. Uh, and we mourn with her and just really appreciative of, of those who were able to make the trip to Abilene. One of our elders, uh, Brother Henry uh, Johnson, was able to make it and several other members and 
she was greatly encouraged by the presence of those who were there. On yesterday, uh, Shannon Bailey's father was laid to rest, Sam Bailey. Uh, it was a wonderful home-going celebration at the Cedar Valley Church of Christ and Brother Sam Bailey's son delivered the eulogy, uh, did a phenomenal job. It takes a certain kind of strength and mental discipline to be able to eulogize someone that's close to you like that. I was really encouraged to see his strength. I was really encouraged to see how the Lord was working with him and that family uh, during that season in their life. They are blessed and they will stand together through this process. We know that we are living in very uh, different times, very difficult and different times. I don't know if the history of this country has faced anything quite like this. We've had racism and protests before, but not quite like this. Uh, we've had uh, illnesses uh, before in this country, but not, not quite like this. We are living in unparalleled times right now. Uh, there is no place in history that we can go to say it's just like this. This is a new season for all of humanity. As we adjust to social unrest and as we adjust to the pandemic that is still ravaging across the land, let us remember that God is and will always be the one who can guide us through these tumultuous times. It is God who we need to rely on. It is, it is God who we need to trust. We don't know how long uh, God is going to withstand the world being as it is before he tells his son, it's time for you to go back. It's time for you to go and bring my people home. I don't know how long God is going to allow the world to rest in the different challenges that we are facing. All I know is, is that we want to be as children of God, faithful to him, faithful to his word, faithful to the spirit that God has placed in every child of his. And in doing so, whenever that time comes, whatever it might be, we want to hear him say, well done. We endured hardships on this land, and he can say, well done. We endured racism in the land, and we responded correctly, and he can say, well done. We had to deal with difficult members of our spiritual family. We dealt with them with the right heart, and he will say, well done. Thy good and thy faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few, and I know it seems like a lot that we're being faithful over right now, but in the grander scheme of things, it's just a few things. Come on up and let me make you ruler over many things. It is a joy to be able to reach so many people in so many places 
with the word of God. This is an unprecedented time as people are searching for the truth. I got a text message from a classmate of mine from high school. And seen her since we graduated in 1976. Sent me a text that she listened to the message and she got it, exclamation point, she said. I was greatly encouraged by that to know that in South Carolina, in Florida, in New York, and even in Bermuda, men and women are tuning in and listening to the word of God being proclaimed. God has never had a better platform for getting his word out than he has right now. Isn't it interesting that in his infinite wisdom, in a time when we can't seemingly come together, that we're reaching more people today than we've ever reached before coming through our doors makes you kind of rethink what ministry is really all about. Maybe God really does know what he's doing when we don't know what is going on. Amen? Amen. I better get to my message this morning. Before I do, I want to open up with our song. I want you to join along with us if you are able. My hallelujah belongs to you. 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 And my hallelujah belongs to you. You deserve it. You deserve it. You deserve it. You deserve it. Because all of the glory belongs to you. And all of the glory belongs to you. All of the glory belongs to you. And all of the glory belongs to you. Amen. We are now embarking on a journey concerning does God care? We're in part two of, of that journey, and we want to continue to peel back some of the layers of how do Christians deal with issues that seemingly go unchecked, seemingly go unrequited, seemingly goes without anyone paying attention. Does God care? This morning I want us to consider a spiritual view of, of trials, a spiritual way for us to look at trials. Trials come on every hand, and we do not understand all the ways that God will lead us to that blessed promised land. But he'll guide us with his eye, and we'll follow until we die, as the song goes, and we will understand it better by and by. James writes, in James chapter 1, in verse number 2, 
my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into different temptations. The word being used as temptations in this text is dealing with those things that are happening with outside of you that are testing your faith, that are trying your patience. It is not the temptation he talks about later on in this chapter that has to deal with the desires that we have in our heart and we have to deal with the urges that happen within us. But James is talking about, brother, count it all joy when you fall into situations you have no control over and yet they are impacting you. He's writing to a group of Christians who are dealing with trials, external trials, the government, those in charge are pressing down on children of God. They, they are trying them. They are locking them up. They are arresting them. They are persecuting them. Anybody found calling on the name of the Lord as king is being tested and tried in a special way. And James says to them, you ought to count it all joy when you fall into different temptations. You ought to count it all joy. Every time I read that text, it seems kind of paradoxical that we are to be able to rejoice when we are going through things that are trying us. How do we go to a place of joy? How do we experience a place of, 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 of joy when we are going through trials? James says this, knowing this, there are some things that children of God just have to know. If you're in the faith, you're living this Christian journey, there are some things that you just have to know in order to make the journey. One of those things is this. you got to understand that whenever your faith is tried, whenever you are going through external things that are beyond your control and they are testing your faith, you got to understand that the trying of your faith, your faith has to be tried and your faith, when it is tried, worketh patience. You cannot develop spiritual patience unless your faith is being tried. You cannot enjoy spiritual patience unless your faith is being tested. You can't know whether or not you are growing in this world without going through something that's pressing you and when it presses you, when you endure it, your faith being tried will develop spiritual patience. And every child of God needs some spiritual patience, not just patience. Spiritual patience. Spiritual patience enables you to go through something that you wouldn't normally be able to go through and show a spirit of Christ while going through it. Spiritual patience. So God, what are you doing? It's the question. We ask God, what are you doing? I'm going through something that I ought not have to go through. What are you doing? 
There are times when life just doesn't make sense to us. This is real. There are, there are times when we're going through things and we just can't understand why, how, how can this be happening? Why is this happening? There are times when life just doesn't make sense to us. We simply don't understand the point of our suffering. We don't understand what's the point. What am I to get out of this? How am I to benefit going through this? We don't understand the point. We're asking, what are you doing, God? And we don't understand. You see, the mystery of human suffering may not be solved completely in this life. It's a mystery. It is something that is not fully revealed. The mystery of human suffering, we might not solve this completely in our lifetime. We, we may never fully understand in our lifetime. Why? We will be, if the Lord delays his coming, we'll be reading about 2020 for years to come, trying to make sense of what's going on, and we will still never fully understand it. You see, sometimes we suffer simply because we are human. And our bodies change as we get older. Sometimes we suffer just because we're living. And while you're living in this life, your body will change. Just keep living. Just keep getting up. And what more are you going to get up and it will never be the same after you get up that morning because some change. Human, our bodies just change as we get older. I remember, I, re I remember, seemed like yesterday, but it wasn't, but I remember when I was a, when I was a younger man, younger man, and felt physically fit, took pride in being in shape, worked out, and had an arduous workout routine. Wouldn't be nothing for me to turn upside down and do inverted push-ups with my feet up on the ceiling, pressing my weight, and I could do that. Man, I just hopped back down. If I had up today on my hands, my neck might be broke. Because if I went down, I know I couldn't get back up. The bodies change as we get older. Used to run all the time. Jog for miles. I just walk at a steady pace now. On my treadmill, I don't hit the pavement no more. They used to play sports at the church here. We used to have a turkey bowl game on Thanksgiving. Every Thanksgiving, young men would come together and we'd meet across at Clark Stadium to play football uh, on Thanksgiving Day. There'd be a crowd of men out there and look like everybody wanted to hit me. Just looked that way. Now, it may not have been there. It just felt that way. Everybody wanted to get in the licking on me, you know, and we were playing tackle. That's what it ended up being, tackle, with no pads. I remember the last time I played, <laughs> uh, my son was out there with me. 
My youngest son was out there playing with me. And after that game, I told my wife, I retired. I ain't going back no more. Uh, I heard in places I didn't know I had after that game. Our bodies change as we get older. Our sight changes as we get older. Things start happening as we get older. I never will forget, and I'm going to go on, but, but I know we're talking about body change. I never forget one Sunday morning, I was in the pulpit, not here. We were at the old building. I was in the pulpit getting ready to preach. And I opened up my Bible and somebody changed the print. I couldn't read the writing. I don't know what happened that one between the last time I got up and opened it and that time I couldn't read nothing on the print. Bodies changed. Had to go see the, the eye doctor the next day. Say, Doc, what's going on? The bodies that bring us pleasure can also bring us pain. Our bodies that, that, that took care of us start breaking down. Somebody knows what I'm talking about. Body breaking down. You used to be able to do, but the body won't let you do. The mind still knows how, but the body won't let you. I, I remember, I remember uh, uh, one of our elders, Chief, Chief Henderson, uh, can play some mean ping pong. I mean, he can flat out play. Well, I can play a little too. And we locked up and we were smashing balls all over the place. And I asked Brother Ed not long ago, we got a ping pong table in the church building in the garage. I said, Ed, when the last time you pulled it out? He said, it ain't coming out no more. Okay, he threw, he threw a ping pong. Can't stretch no more like that. Our bodies that bring us pleasure can also bring us pain. The same family and friends that delight us can also break our hearts. You watch the children. They grow up and they're so cute. They're so obedient. They're so dutiful. But they grow up. And they finally decide that the journey that you have been on in the straight and narrow is not the journey that they want to walk right now. Breaks your heart. You took them to church. They ain't going no more. Breaks your heart. You showed them the way. They not walking no more breaks your heart. You taught them how to trust God, but they don't even want to talk about God. Breaks your heart. I feel like preaching this morning. Breaks your heart. I in a conversation may say, I, I just, just thought that becoming a Christian would make my life better. I thought that when I gave my, my life to Christ and I really started putting forth an effort that my life would be better. We talked to ourselves. I thought becoming a Christian would make my life easier. I'll not have to deal with some of the stuff that I used to have to deal with. I'm a child of God now. It ought to be easier, we say to ourselves. I thought becoming a Christian would solve my problems. I'm now trusted in God. God, I thought, would work them out. I thought he would clear the path. I'd be on easy street 
because I'm serving the Almighty now. I'm trying to do right. You know, didn't always try, but I'm trying to do right now. I'm trying to live. Didn't always try, but I'm making it ever. And it just looked like the more I try to do right, the more problems I seem to have. We have to learn then to view life through spiritual eyes. We have to learn how to look at life through spiritual eyes. You see, there are some paradoxical statements in Christianity that, that must be understood and accepted as true if you are to live a successful life. Christian life. Some paradoxical statement. In other words, paradox. You say this, but, but it ought not be like this. It's a paradox. What are some of those? Listen, in order to save your life, you must be willing to lose it. That's a paradox. You're trying to save it, but in order to save it, you got to lose it. Paradox. That, that, you got to accept this as truth. If you don't accept being true, that in order for me to save me, I got to lose me, you'll be trying to save you, and you're going to be losing you. That's a paradox. My strength is made perfect in weakness. That's a paradox. My strength, I'm strongest when I'm weak, I am at my best when I'm going through my worst. That's a paradox. That don't make sense to us. But it's the truth when you're looking through spiritual eyes. See, but if, you, you, if you're looking through carnal eyes, you don't see life like this. You don't think you're going to get stronger by going through anything. You don't think that in order to save your life, you got to lose it. You're trying to save you, but you're losing your life. You see, Christ offers salvation from sin. Sin, not suffering. Christ offers saving us from sin. He never said he was going to save us from suffering. We think we've been saved from sin and suffering. But Christ only offers salvation from sin. Listen to Luke 9, verse number 23. And he said unto them all, If any man will come after me, let him Deny himself. Let him take up his cross. How often? Daily. Every day you got to take up the cross. You laid it down last night when you went to bed. Only to pick it up when you got up this morning. You thought between the time you went to sleep and the time you got up, Cross be gone. Cross still there. And you got to pick it up every single day and follow him. For whosoever, verse 24, will save his life shall lose it. And right now we're living in a time when men and women are focusing on saving their life. We're living in times where it's more important for me to have my rights than to have the Lord. We're living in times where saving your life is paramount. But I want you to know with spiritual lives, you got to understand, Jesus still says, for whosoever will save his life, shall lose his life. But whosoever will lose your life for my sake. Wait a minute. 
for my sake, for doing what God says, for following the word, for practicing the word, the same will save it. Listen, Paul in 2 Corinthians 12, verse number 9, when he goes to the Lord three times about an issue that he had three times, Lord, please remove this thorn. Lord, take away this infirmity. Finally, the Lord answers. And he said, my grace is sufficient for thee. Wait a minute. My grace is enough to carry you through your issue. Watch this. Jesus said, for my strength, the strength you get from above, the strength you get for relying on him, the strength you get for trusting him, the strength you get for enduring for him, you don't get it. It's made perfect not when we're at our best, not when we are on top, not when we got it under control. No, no, no. Spiritual strength is made perfect in weakness. That's Jesus saying. Oh, no, 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 Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. You need to understand you're at the best spiritually when you're in your weak point because you are relying on me and not trusting on you. Paul said, most gladly, therefore, then. Thank you for helping me understand. Most gladly, therefore, then, will I rather glory in my infirmities. Lord, thank you for trials that I didn't have to have, but it's helping me to trust you. Lord, thank you for the burden that I'm going through. I understand now that you are helping me. Lord, I thank you for putting on me this burden today so that now I can glory in my infirmities. Watch this, that the power of Christ, in order for the strength of Christ to rest upon me. When's the last time you experienced the power of Christ carrying you through a trial? Well, see, you don't experience the, the power of Christ when you're trying to save your life. You only experience the power of Christ resting on you when you are losing your life and glorying in infirmities. Are you following me? Are you following me? Am I helping anybody? Listen, the Lord knows how to balance our lives. The Lord knows how. If we have only blessings, we may become proud. There was a song somebody sent me on last week all song we used to listen to back in the 70s. Be grateful. God has not promised me sunshine. That's not the way it's going to be. But a little rain, the sun goes, mixed with God's sunshine. A little pain, the story goes, makes me appreciate the good times. Be grateful. So God permits us to have burdens as well. And the burdens are there to teach you how to trust him. I know you don't like the burdens. I, I, I know you don't appreciate, but until you learn how to look at the burden as an opportunity for you to grow with him, then you don't understand what glorying in infirmities is all about. Until you know 
that God is with you in the trial until you know that God is right there in the midst of the bird. Stop feeling sorry for yourself. Stop acting like the world is not treating you right and start seeing the hand of God. You see, God allowed Satan to buffet Paul in order to prevent him from becoming proud. Ain't no telling what we might do if we had everything going our way. Ain't no telling what we, we might not see you no more at church if everything was going right. You, you might say, I don't need that no more. I got it. But you got enough trouble going on to make you still look up. Enough problems going on to make you still stretch out your hand. So God allows Satan to buffet him. See, in God's grace, he forgives our sins. But in his government, he's a just God. He must per permit us to reap what we sow. He forgives the sin. But we reap what we sow. He's not counting it against you. But you reap what you sow. If you engage in premarital sex before you marry, and you apply the law of procreation, and you know you have sinned, and you repent of that sin. But that baby is on the way. And the baby gonna be here for a long time. You asked God to forgive you and he did. But you gotta deal with the reality of a blended family from now on. You reap what you sow. Now was Paul sinning? I'm praying for God to remove his, his throne? Absolutely not. Absolutely nothing wrong with asking God to take a burden away from us. Nothing wrong with asking God to right a wrong in your life. There's nothing wrong with that. But God is not obligated to heal every believer when we pray. But he encourages us to bring our burdens and sorrows to him. Take your burdens to the Lord and leave them there. But God will determine which ones he's going to take from you. And I promise you, he's not going to take them all. He's going to leave you with some that will try your faith. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh spiritual patience. You see, God gave Paul a strange gift. God gave Paul a strange gift. 2 Corinthians 12, verse 7, And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations. Wait a minute, what are you saying, Paul? God has really blessed me and given me extraordinary insight. More than some of my brothers. More than some of the other apostles. They didn't write about it because God didn't show them. Paul said, now lest I get exalted, lest I start feeling so special, that was given to me. It was given to me, a thorn in the flesh. It was given to, here's a gift for you, Paul. Well, I don't want it. Well, you got to take it. It's a thorn in your flesh. The messenger of Satan was given 
to buffet. And let me suggest to you that there are some folk in your life that God has in your life that are there to buffet. You. And I want you to know everybody needs buffeting every now and then. Everybody needs something that brings them back down to earth and causes them to say, Lord, I need you. And I don't know what that something is for you, but I know it's in your life. I know it may be physical, as some of the experts say about Paul. It was a physical malady, perhaps, you know, but it could be something other than physical in your body. It could be external. God puts you in a situation where Satan is around you and you can't get him out. That's why when it comes to the church, I know you'll never get rid of all the sinners out of the church because he might get rid of you. He's going to always have sinners in the church. Why? Because somebody has to buffer you, buffet you. Somebody is there to trouble you. And stop thinking life is not fair because you be in trouble. Paul said, I got it. Lest I should be exalted above measure. There's something humbling about having to deal with the devil. That, that, there's something that, that brings you back to earth when you got to deal with the devil. You see, Paul accepted his affliction as a gift from God. He accepted it. He accepted it. See, God didn't give Paul any explanation as to why. Instead, he gave him a promise. The promise is, my grace will get you through. I ain't going to take it away, but my grace will cover you. I'm going to give you enough strength to endure this. Just hang on. Well, wouldn't it be easier, Lord, if you just, just did with it? We didn't have to do all that. No, you need it. So I'm going to leave it with you, and your, my grace is going to get you through. You see, we don't live our lives on explanations. We live on promises. We live our lives on the promises of God. Our feelings may change, but God's promises never change. When God says, he'll never leave you, nor forsake you, never change. When God says, you can do all things through me, never changes. When God says to me, come with all the things that are burdening you and are laying you down and I'll give you rest, never changes. And so we then learn to count it all Joy, all joy. We learn how to do this. This is not a natural thing. This is not a human thing. This is a spiritual thing. You learn how to count it all joy when you fall into different temptations outside of you that you didn't cause. Outside of you. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. A, a Christian spiritual view of trials. I trust I've said something on this morning that has spoken to your spirit, that has helped you to see where you are in relations to dealing with your life challenges. If you're not a member of the body of Christ, I trust that you know that there is a strength that you are missing in dealing with life. That strength can only be derived 
from complete obedience and trusting in the word of God. You do this by believing that Jesus died for your sins according to the scripture. That he was buried and he rose again the third day. Are you willing to repent of your sins? Confess him as Lord and surrender to baptism. Yes, you need somebody to engage with you because you got to be baptized for the remission of your sins. That's why we have a baptistry here. So when someone decides they are ready to obey the gospel, they can be like the unit. See, here's water. What does hinder me from being baptized? We'll add you to the body called the church if you remember the body of Christ. And as James was writing to the people of God in James 1, maybe you've been struggling with dealing with your trials. Maybe you've been asking too many times, why, Lord? Why me, Lord? Why now, Lord? Perhaps you have felt that it is not fair. I hope you can get a different perspective about trials this morning. I hope you can look at it differently. And if you've taken the wrong position by trying to save your life, I trust that you'll be willing to repent of that position. Ask God to forgive you. Ask him for strength. And he'll forgive you. You can start the journey now, knowing that there are certain trials that may never leave your life, but that doesn't mean that God is not with you. Whatever your need, whatever your desire, we trust that you will make it known on today. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for once again allowing us to come together in a way that still connects spirits, though our physical presence is not seen by each other. You've already always operated by spiritual presence. You've never had to be there right with us where we see you. And yet, Father, we know you're always there with us. And now we're learning how to trust our spiritual senses more than we are trusting our physical senses. Thank you, Lord, for helping us to learn how to rely on those things that aren't seen as being more important than the things which we see. Thank you for your word. And thank you for the power you gave me to deliver your word today. I trust somebody has heard your voice. Somebody is ready to respond to your voice. Somebody is calling on you right now. I pray, Father, that there's someone that doesn't know you in the pardoning of their sins. They'll call us today. That we'll make arrangements to add them to the body called the church by baptizing them into your son's name. Father, there's some member of the body today who is feeling burdened, overburdened by life. That they come to terms with you being with them as they go through the journeys of life. Thank you for your son which showed us a way. Thank you for your spirit, which guides us in this way. Thank you, God, for loving us enough to make provisions for us. And we give you all the glory, honor, and praise for any good that comes from this. And we ask this with thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Amen. We trust you have been encouraged today and as we do on every Lord's Day we want to focus on another part of what we call our worshiping. One is giving back to God as he has always given to us. 
We give in accordance to how we have been blessed, how we've been prospering. I'll not rob God. You're not getting in the habit of trying to see how little you can give God and feel good about it. You ought not say that I make greater sacrifices for my diet, what I eat, than I do for what God has blessed me with. That I'll put more money on those things that are significant to me than I will to God. I have more money going to memberships than I do to the kingdom. I'll not be said that of anybody. So we trust that you will give and give generously so that the work of the Lord will continue here on earth. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for hearts that have been moved this morning. And thank you, Father, for the generous gifts that are being received. We know, Father, that you provide for all of us You've given all of us what we have. And Father, we count it a joy to be able to give back to you. Thank you for giving us what we have. And thank you for receiving the gifts that we give. We ask this prayer with thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Amen. At this time, we want to prepare our hearts for reflecting on the greatest sacrifice that has ever taken place in humanity, and that is Jesus Christ sacrificing his life for the whole world. He didn't die for a segment of the population. He didn't die for just one nationality. He didn't die for those that are rich. He didn't die for just those that are poor. He died for all humanity. And he asks us to never, ever, ever come together and not remember his great sacrifice. How do we do that? He gave us symbols. The symbol of his body being broken is found in the taking of unleavened bread. The symbol of his blood being spilled is symboled by the fruit of the vine. When he told us this, he said, this is my body now. And this is my blood. And so we want to thank God for allowing his body to be broken. We want to thank him for allowing his blood to be shed. Let us do so at this time. God, we thank you for the breaking of your body, coming into the form of human flesh, and allowing your body to be broken. The pain that you experienced for us, we thank you. May we never forget your great sacrifice in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us partake of the broken body. Let us pray for the shedding of his blood. Father, we thank you for your blood being spilt. Thank you for enduring the pain of the piercing of that spear in your side. And out of that side came blood and water. Thank you, Father, for purchasing the body called the church with your blood. 
May we never forget your great, great sacrifice. May we always remember your great love for us. And may we be endeared to you because of that great love in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us partake. We have listened to the word today and sang songs of Zion. We've given to the Lord and we've communed with him. At this time, we will have a song and then the closing remarks by our elder, Henry Johnson. Thank you again for being a part of our service. God has smiled on me. He has set me free. Oh, say God has smiled on me. He's been good to me. One more time, sing, God has smiled on me, and he has set me free. My Lord, God has smiled on me. He's been good to me. We're so thankful today for this service and for the message brought to us that has sunk down into many hearts this morning because it's so easy to fall into the activities and the events of this world and get carried away by them. We begin to forget who we are and why we're here and what God has done for us, which he has delivered us from much of and all and can deliver us from all of the things that are taking place here. Before we have a dismissal prayer, I'd like to read to you from Colossians, the third chapter, which says, Since then you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God, Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these, th in these ways, in the life you once lived. But now you must rid yourself of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, since you have taken off your old self with its practices, and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. You've heard it. Here there is no Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, slave or free, for Christ is all and is, and it is in all. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. 
Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these things, these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let us pray. Our God and our Father, we thank you so much for this time that you've given us to share, Father, with those who have taken on you, Father, in baptism and have lived the life and are continuing to live the life that you would have us to live, Father, as Christians. We know that there are pitfalls. We know that Satan is busy throwing what roadblocks and so forth and so on. But we must remain faithful, Father, remain strong, and let us encourage one another with telephone calls, messages, or whatever it takes, Father, to build each other up and to help each other make it through the day, through the year, as we go in through this pandemic and other events that we feel are untasteful, but we know that you know what you're doing, Father. And that is the main thing. Be with us now as we leave this place and go into another week, Father, uh, blessings from you. Be with us now and keep us is our prayer. Amen. Once again, we'd like to thank you for joining us this Sunday morning. We hope that the Word of God has reached out and touched you in some kind of way. Now, please remember to tune in for Wednesday night at 7 p.m. for our Bible study. God bless and have a great day.